Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, all right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It's 10 o'clock right now. Welcome again to uh, another homegrown uh, series. Uh, today we have Kim Perry, the Prairie View uh, Egg Agent. She's going to be talking about fall vegetable gardening. Uh, next week I am up, Brandy Keller with Elements of Landscape Design. And then just to give you a sneak peek into September, we are uh, we are not going to be presenting the first week in September because we ourselves have training, uh, but then we'll be right back into the second week. So uh, right now we have Kim. Again, thank you all for being here. We uh, we so enjoy providing these lectures and uh, it really helps to know that uh, you all appreciate them too. So Kim, welcome. Oh, hi. Hi. Thank you, Brandy, for that introduction. Thank you, everybody, for joining, taking time out of your busy day to uh, learn a little bit about fall vegetables. Um, as Brandy said, my name is Kim Perry, and today we're going to focus a little bit more on the varieties of fall vegetables. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, guys, so for all my fall vegetable gardeners, I would say the most important thing is to begin with a plan. All right, so that plan consists of seven key elements. What do you want to grow? If you're a first time gardener, I say start small. Even if you're a more seasoned gardener, sometimes it's, I would still say start small to medium. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I go out and people have a half acre or three acres and they're a church garden and they want to create uh, 30 raised beds and then you drive by a year later and all raised beds are filled with weeds and or grass. So start small and realistic. Number two, analyze your space and sketch out a design. Uh, so you want to take a look, make sure uh, that you have enough space there for what you're trying to plant. Um, number three, determine if the location is full sun, part sun, shade, full shade, and make sure it's next to some type of water source. Okay, this is really important, guys, as you're growing any of your crops, spring or fall. Create a list of vegetables that you would like to grow. OK, so write down the, that list. There's many wonderful different varieties. Uh, purple cabbage, there's uh, cheddar uh, cauliflower, which is this beautiful orange cauliflower. Just lots of things out there. So just create a list of things you'd like to grow. Uh, one of the most important things on this list probably should be number one is prepare your soil. Make sure your soil has enough nutrients um, and get it ready for your fall crops. Use mulch around your plants. So that'll help with a lot of funguses, diseases, insects, uh, and just overall water retention. Okay, and number seven is plant during the proper season. So sometimes I, I get a lot of questions and a part of those questions are things like, OK, Kim, uh, my lettuce plant is super bitter now um, and it's in July. They've started the lettuce uh, in the spring and it's now July. Well, it's out of season, so uh, start your plants during the proper season. All right. So what varieties to plant in the fall? So we're not going to cover every single uh, every single one of these vegetable varieties. We're going to cover a couple, but I did want to show you what you could actually plant in the fall. And if you look at the lovely picture over on the right that was uh, provided to me by uh, Master Gardener Chevy Tang, 
you can see all the wonderful things that she has planted in that that uh, that raised bed garden and everything is flourishing and looking great. So um, cabbage, of course, you plant in the fall, beets, cauliflower, tomatoes, carrots, lettuce, turnip greens, kohlrabi, broccoli, kale, mustards, spinach, and collard greens. So we're not gonna talk about tomatoes on this slide, but I would like to add that tomatoes, I have the most success with tomatoes during the fall. Um, it's just less stress on the plants and less insects for me. The challenge with tomatoes in the fall is you wanna grow Roma type tomatoes or cherry type tomatoes. When you grow the great big beefsteak tomatoes, Often your plant, you'll get this great big beautiful plant. It'll start to put on tomatoes and boom, a frost hits, takes out all your tomatoes. So you want something that doesn't take as long to uh, mature. All right, so deciding what to use, transplants for slower growing vegetables or should you use seeds? Uh, and just direct sow that into the soil. So for plants like kale, carrots, radishes, beets, turnips, collard greens, uh, lettuces, and spinach, I would recommend direct sowing those into the soil uh, for several reasons. Things like carrots hate to be transplanted. They, they go into transplant shock very easy and they usually don't make it, which is why you often don't see carrots at all uh, as little transplants. Um, so looking on the left-hand side, which you wanna start from transplants are tomatoes, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts. And the reason being, guys, is because often these Plants take a long time to germinate, and it's just easier to start from transplants. Uh, things like cauliflower uh, can be a little challenging to grow. Brussels sprouts, hands down, <laughs> it's a little bit challenging to grow. So if you could start with transplants, that's great. Uh, Towards the bottom here, you see leafy greens need four to six hours of sun. Things like lettuce, chard, collards, mustards, and spinach. And jumping back to the left-hand side, roots and heading crops need six to eight hours of sun, okay? Cabbage, beets, radishes, broccoli, uh, cabbage, and cauliflower. All right, so often there's a debate. Should I plant hybrids or heirlooms? It all depends on your personal preference and what you actually like to grow and what you're trying to accomplish. So a few of those differences, uh, what would, would jumps out at me for the heirlooms is you can save the seeds and grow the same type of plants over and over again. Uh, often, when you're in the city or if you have a, a small plot, you don't necessarily grow the same things over and over. Uh, some say that the heirloom varieties taste fantastic, some of the, the tomatoes especially. Um, over here on the other side with the hybrids, if you want a more uni uniform uh, vegetable, then the hybrids are good. A lot of the things have been uh, altered so it's it's great for funguses and things of that nature so with the hybrids it helps with the the controlled breeding uh, uniform genetics you get the same type of plant every time it's improved disease resistance reliable production and if you have a community garden or um, a church garden that's really important, that reliable production if you're selling at the farmer's markets or, or selling anywhere for things of that nature, you, you want that more unified look 
Uh, heirlooms sometimes don't give that, don't provide that. So offspring may not uh, possess same desirable traits used to purchase seeds. So that basically says if you're growing a hybrid variety and you try to save those seeds and regrow those seeds, it's not going to turn out the same typically. And I can attest to that. <laughs> so with heirlooms, they're open, po open pollinated. Usually they've been around for a long time, okay? Um, they're hand, often handed down through friends, families, communities, known for old fashioned flavors, um, unusual colors and appearances. Problem is, is sometimes they have unpredictable results and the growth yield and maturity can of course uh, be different with the heirlooms. All right, so garden ideas. So this is right smack in the middle of the city. This is in uh, the third ward area, and this is um, Seeds of the Soil. The, the picture was provided to me by Nathan Hawthorne, and this is his wonderful raised bed gardens. So he changed his complete backyard to raised bed gardens, and you can see all the wonderful varieties that he is growing. Okay. So let's first, let's talk about beets. So beets, you all parts of the plants are edible. Um, you think of the roots, the roots are below the, the tuber, the actual beets. The tops are delicious as well as the beets. You can use the tops, the, the more tender leaves, the young leaves and salads or sh as they get a little bit older, you can use those and stir fries, the flavor is a little bit stronger. Okay, beets grow best in deep, well-drained soil, uh, sandy loam. Roots can grow deep. Um, some beets, the beets can tolerate some shade, but they do well. And full sun, we're talking about uh, winter crops, of course. You can grow beets pretty much throughout the entire fall to early spring. You want to keep that clear. All these vegetables I'm talking about, you want to keep clear of weeds because weeds uh, compete for nutrients and they often harbor uh, pests and funguses and diseases. So planting beets, you can plant them throughout the, you can go ahead and start right now with direct sow and those will start to come up for you. Beets emerge typically between seven to 14 days. You just want to keep that soil moist and uni unified, evenly moist, okay, through the end until those plants germinate. All right, so fertilizing, harvesting beets, a balanced fertilizer because again, you're growing for the tops and the beets. Uh, of course, if you want larger tops, you use a little bit more nitrogen. Uh, this should be incorporated and in planting several times during the season. Beets are very sensitive to soil, soil borne deficiencies, okay? Depending on the variety you use, there's golden beets, uh, all different types. They should be ready to harvest between 56 to 72 days. Uh, Want to keep those moist and definitely uh, irrigate deeper as the season progresses and as the beets grow uh, for beets. All right, so take a, a look here and we're not going to talk about every type of disease or um, insect, but these are some of the things that affect uh, beets and other coal crops. So the thing that I see the most are these aphids here on the right hand side. Aphids are just a pain. 
Often we see leaf miners. Leaf miners aren't too big of a problem, but just take note of some of the things, uh, some of the pests and um, diseases. All right, let's move on to carrots. So carrots grow best in loose, well-drained, sandy loam soil. Uh, the soil you need to work in, uh, definitely work in some compost for the, the gumbo soils that we have here. And zone nine, um, carrots, carrots can tolerate some shade. They do well in full sun though. But one of the most important things with carrots, remember we're sowing those seeds directly in the soil and you want to make sure that the, the roots of the carrots have enough space to grow and they're unified, okay? So take a look at this picture here. And this is uh, different types of varieties of carrots, depending on how much soil, uh, depending on your garden space that you're trying to grow the carrots in. If you have, say, a container in your porch, you might wanna use some of the smaller carrots. Uh, if you have a, a larger space or box, you can use some of the bigger carrots. It all depends on you. If you're trying to get quick, fast results for say a school garden or community gardens, you can use things like the Oxford carrots, okay? All right, and these are some of the diseases and insects that attack the carrots. So powdery mildew, black root rot, root knot nematodes, wire worm, okay, carrot fly maggots, and cutworms. Okay, so those are just a, a few of the insects and diseases you want to take note of. All right, so turnip greens and greens, site and soil. So turnip, strangely, oddly enough, when I first grew turnip greens, I didn't realize, I thought they were just regular collard greens. I didn't realize I grew turnip greens. And in fact, growing up, we never had turnips. So when it was time for me to flip the soil at the end of the season, I, would, I was digging around my plant and there were these ginormous turnips that were no longer edible. But <laughs> so, uh, Make sure you just take note of the type of greens that you're growing. I just put myself out there, but it's true. <laughs> so grow best, it grows best in well-drained soil, uh, kind of a sandy loam because you want the unified turnip greens, uh, the unified turnips, I should say. They prefer full sun. Um, they grow best when temperatures are at least 40 degrees. Okay, seeds or transplants, uh, it doesn't matter with the turnip greens, okay? Uh, when you harvest the greens as the turnips are still growing, you don't wanna clip all of the greens. And if you're planting from seeds, they usually emerge between three to seven days. All right, so harvesting. Depending on the variety that you're growing, turnips should be ready for harvest in 50 to 60 days. Generally, uh, the turnips range from two to three inches in diameter. So harvest the outside turnip leaves, of course, before the weather gets hot. Uh, when the plants get stressed and there's, uh, they do attract uh, aphids. If you have aphids, you can just Take your water hose and spray them off really well. Uh, another thing to help with the aphids is to treat for your fire ants, okay? Uh, the fire ants help to mind the aphids, meaning they kind of protect them because they like the honeydew that the aphids exclude, okay? So after the plants emerge, apply a high, higher nitrogen-based fertilizer 
to improve growth and help plants to grow uniformly. The crops especially need phosphorus. This is important. So fertilize regularly during the season. After you uh, harvest your turnips, they should store in the refrigerator for a while, maybe two to three weeks longer, or two to three weeks. All right, so some of the pests and diseases for turnips, turnip greens, and this isn't just for turnip greens, of course, these are just pests and diseases that affect a lot of our coal crops. Um, so the club root, the mosaic virus, the white rust, cabbage loopers, aphids, and flea beetles, um, and also root maggots. All right, so in this lovely picture here, you can see collard greens in the center that is kale, and on the right-hand side, those are mustard greens. So talking about collard greens, kale, and mustard greens, if you are new to gardening, these are some of the easiest things that you can grow. In fact, if you have a new garden bed, these are also some of the easiest things to grow along with spinach. So a uh, few of the things that are a little bit more difficult are the Brussels sprouts and things of that nature. So this is a good success if you're new to gardening. So greens grow best in rich, evenly moist soil. You want to incorporate compost into that soil before you actually uh, plant your transplants or begin your seeds. Collards can grow without fertilizer, but of course they grow just a little bit better with fertilizer. And I, I find that mine tolerate uh, full sun, but I like to plant them in partial partial sun, partial shade, and they grow well in flower beds and of course containers. When you're planting, uh, when you're starting your plants, you want to plant a few more seeds than you actually need and then you'll just thin those out over time. You want to keep the soil moist until seedlings emerge and that usually happens between 7 to 14 days so for these crops, they typically mature in 50 to 60 days. However, you can continue to clip uh, the kale or the mustard greens as they some of the young uh, tender leaves emerge. You don't want to take them all away from the plant. You want to make sure to leave some for photosynthesis, but you can harvest as those things are, are grown for you. So a little bit more about the greens. You want to fertilize using a balanced fertilizer. Something like 624 is a, a nice fertilizer. And by the way, guys, I should mention the higher the numbers, the chances are that that's not an organic fertilizer. If the numbers are a little bit smaller, then that chances are that is a organic fertilizer. So the greens, are typically very easy to grow again. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. These are just a few of the problems, diseases, and things of that nature. So again, I think the only one that we didn't talk about is the powder, powdery mildew, and you can uh, avoid some of those things like the powdery mildew with spacing you want to make sure you space your plants properly when they're all crowded together it kind of breeds uh, funguses and mildews and things of that nature uh, you also want to be sure to water your plants uh, in the mornings and you want to water the soil and not the actual leaves all right so let's talk a little bit about spinach and lettuces so both grow best in well-drained, rich soils. They can tolerate some shade and do well in small gardens. You want to keep clear of weeds. The root systems are typically shallow on your lettuces and spinaches. 
Uh, here for zone nine, you want to grow um, leaf lettuce as opposed to heading lettuce. Heading lettuce requires a lot of cold and we often don't get enough cold to actually grow things like iceberg lettuce. Uh, we do a lot better with uh, leaf lettuces. So space seedlings two to three inches apart in a row. And again, you can thin those out as the seedlings emerge in seven to 14 days. All right, so the biggest problem that I've seen with the spinach and lettuce are, again, the pesky aphids. So an aphids can be different colors. They can be green, uh, yellow, black. So you just wanna keep an eye out for your, your plants. Check it pretty much every day and you can avoid some of these pests. Uh, again, with the lettuce family, the, the lettuces and the spinaches, they grow well in small gardens and flower beds, okay? The seeds are usually tiny, tiny for the lettuce seeds. So it helps to uh, create just a little bit of a, a tape roll and you can drop those seeds on there, say uh, on a piece of toilet, toilet paper that you've cut out and gently set moist that toilet paper, set those, place those seeds on there, and gently place it in the garden. Cover it with a little bit of soil, a fourth inch deep, and water. All right, one of my favorites is kohlrabi. Grew this a couple years ago. This is a beautiful and very interesting vegetable. It tastes delicious. Uh, if you've never tried it before. Kohlrabi grows best in well-drained, medium texture soils. It prefers a pH of 5.5 to 7.5. It grows best in full sun. You can plant this in the fall or spring and it tolerates fluctuating temperatures, uh, but it, it does best if the temperature is between 70 to 60, or should I say 60 to 70 degrees, and the night temperatures as well, ranging from 40 to 50. Okay, seed, you can grow these from seeds or transplants. You wanna make sure you have young transplants though, because if you have older transplants, they don't transplant very well. You wanna grow these guys a foot apart from one another, and you plant the seeds about a fourth of an inch to half of an inch deep, Keep soil moist until the seedlings emerge. And kohlrabi usually uh, emerges within seven to 10 days. All right, so here is a, a beautiful purple kohlrabi. And kohlrabi prefers higher levels of nitrogen than potassium or phosphorus. You wanna apply nitrogen at planting, then follow with other nutrients later in the season. Okay, uh, uniform, you want this uniform look with your, your bulbs for kohlrabi. And again, the entire plant is edible, the, the bulb as well as the leaves. Okay. All right, so one of my favorites, and I should also uh, put this out here, I wanna thank uh, one of the master gardeners, Teresa Sees, for providing some of her lovely pictures for to helping me with the slides. I decided to, I wanted to use a lot of pictures from other people's gardens because, you know, gardening kind of works symbiotically. You need all these different elements in order for your garden to flourish. So I have a lot of garden buddies and friends and they help me flourish and grow just like the gardens, okay? So cabbage, cabbage grows best in fertile, rich, well-drained soil. The ideal pH is 6.5 to 7.0 to reduce the risk of club foot, okay? They can tolerate some shade but prefers full sun and cabbages can become huge. 
So they can get big, so you want to spread uh, seed those accordingly. Of course, again, you plant more seeds than you anticipate uh, vegetables, and then you just kind of thin them out. And cabbage do take a long time. I should uh, note that one seed equates to one head of cabbage. So cabbage are kind of cool if you have the real estate for it. All right, so some of the problems again are black rot leaf, black rot stem, powdery mildew, cabbage loopers, and uh, downy mildew. Okay, also diamondback moth, flea beetles, and the the dredged white flies. All right, so. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit faster because we're running out of time. So this is broccoli. Uh, the entire plant is delicious and edible. When it's cold outside, those that head of broccoli in the center is nice and tight, but even if it goes to flower, it's still edible. Uh, broccoli requires a nutrient rich soil. It can tolerate some shade. It's not recommended for containers just because the leaves get so big, but you need those big leaves uh, to actually get the crown for your broccoli. Okay, so you need a, a, a soil a nitrogen rich fertilizer for those and it's one plant per seed again. So three types of broccoli are, are right here. One of my favorite is the broccolini because I can just keep harvesting that and use it in salads and soups and stews, and it'll just put on a new head for me. So these are three popular types of, of broccoli that tend to do well for us. So heading towards the end, it's very important to weed and mulch, weed and mulch, weed and mulch, okay? Weeds can harbor insects, diseases, nematodes, and shade out uh, some of the slow growing crops. So weeds can also use up your nitrogen and need it moisture and cause irregular shapes for things like your beets uh, and uh, make your plants yield lower quality vegetables. So in this picture over here on the right, this is a garden and with this as the plants begin to emerge, we just lay down newspaper and then mulch on top of the newspaper and that typically lasts all season long. All right, so again, special thanks to Nathan, Chevy and Teresa for all the beautiful pictures. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful purple, uh, this is purple cauliflower. So purple cauliflower and those leaves are so delicious. I've had the leaves from broccoli and cauliflower and they're fantastic. So you can find me on Facebook. Um, you can friend me and you'll see other events that are coming up and I'll share recipes and things like that. If you have any questions, please let me know. You're, you're free to send me an email or um, if you have any questions, add them in the chat box and I will try to answer as many as I can or you can just send me a private note. And that is it for now, guys. Next Thursday, uh, the lovely Miss Brandy Keller will be provide will give a talk on landscape design, which is something very important. I think that we can all use. All right. Oop. All right. Kim, um, ooh, I think I have an echo. Uh, let's just double check to see. We've answered a lot of the questions. Um, said I garden in a large four foot by four foot container. Would I need to send a sample from each barrel? 
I wonder if she's replying. Um, there was someone that asked about nutrients in the soil, and I recommended that they could get a soil sample. Um, so, Kim, yeah, if you want to answer this, I mean, I, I think, yeah, for each container, they would. Um, it, it depends. I mean, if you're but, new to gardening and this is new soil, uh, you know, as opposed to this is soil that's been there a while. Um, for me, my soil, it, it has telltale signs. We try to do a lot of crop rotation because some of the plant families uh, use a lot of the same nutrients, uh, as well as kind of switching it up so insects can't find that same crop each year. Um, so I, I would get my soil tested if, I mean, actually, if you want to, if you feel like there's something wrong with the soil or if you have a, a large plot. Other than that, uh, I, I have, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend just having it tested to be, to have it tested. All right, and I don't really see any other questions. Uh, there's a lot of thank yous, so I think uh, there are a lot of people that appreciated this lecture today. Oh, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Yep, and and like me on Facebook. And again, I thank you so much for your time. It's a lot to cram in 30 minutes. Believe me, it can go on for two hours <laughs> if we had the time. All right, thanks, Kim. That uh, that concludes uh, this lecture. Again, uh, Kim already mentioned it. Uh, I'll be talking about the elements of landscape design next week. And uh, just to check real quick, Paul, did you see any other questions? Uh, yes, we had one that oh. just popped in here real quick, and this is, Kim would be right in your uh, area. Does turmeric grow well here? And if so, when to plant? Turmeric grows fantastic here. So, and you can start turmeric uh, anytime really, but it's best to start it in the spring or the fall. Uh, you want to have a nice, rich soil, nutrient rich soil, uh, closer to a sandy loam soil, uh, so you can get nice. Uh, nice roots you don't want to definitely don't want to use our gumbo soil um, which can choke out the roots as things dry out but i would start it in a pot uh, and just give it water it prefers a little it prefers even moisture soil okay uh Kim, we got another one here real quick. Um, I don't have a lot of success with growing seeds in the transplant boxes. Any suggestions? Okay, so depending on the type of seed you're growing, uh, for example, uh, just, just shoot me a question and ask and tell me what exactly, which type of variety you're growing. Some of the smaller seeds take a long time. For example, I'm growing something right now called Chinese celery, and it, it's Chinese pink celery. And believe it or not, the seeds are tiny and they take between six to 12, I wanna say eight. It's either six to 12 weeks to emerge. And you would think, okay, this isn't gonna sprout for me, but just keep watering it, even moisture, Make sure your seed package isn't aren't too old because the older your seeds are, the less uh, germination, the, the rates of germination go down. So when they're fresh seeds, you might have, uh, say, a 90% germination rate, meaning that 90% of those seeds in the package are going to germinate. When you have older seeds, that decreases quite a bit and say you plant 50% of those seeds, 50% of them may not come up and you think I'm, I'm no good at this, but it's really the age of the seeds. So it's something important to take note of. Okay, Kim, uh, here's another one. Uh, is it possible to grow cucumbers this time of year? 
Uh, is it possible? Yes. Would I? No. And the reason why is because you can start them, but the first, the first real cold snap you get, the plant is going to die. So what you're growing, remember before most fruit puts on, you get these nice, big, beautiful leaves and this healthy plant, and sometimes the plants just don't have enough time to actually put on the fruit that you're trying to get. Uh, if you're growing, say, in a greenhouse, yeah, you could probably get away with cucumbers, uh, definitely smaller cucumbers, like the Persian cucumbers, but I, I probably wouldn't grow the cucumbers now. I'd probably wait until the spring. OK, yes, I think we are getting to the end of cucumber season. So um, next question, what do you use in your garden to get rid of unwanted pests? Um, so the the best, the most important thing you can do for your garden is your shadow. So if you're out there all the time, then you can see which insects and pests are there and kind of nip it in the bud first. Uh, if you're out there, say, once a week uh, and you have a tomato hornworm, that thing can eat your plant down to the nubs within a couple days. So um, what I do, one of the most important things that I've done is to lay down the newspaper and then to mulch around it. And I try to take care of those red ants early in the season. Uh, from protecting those aphids, from mining the aphids. Oh, OK, uh, next one is um, what about planting potatoes in the fall? Is it too late for Irish potatoes? Um, and if you want, Kim, I'm looking at the planting calendar right here. Yes. And actually, this is probably the prime time for putting that fall crop in. It, it's August into about mid September. So um, if you want to put in Irish potatoes, this is the time of year to get them started. All right. All right. And there's one more here. My okra, it has huge leaves, but no flowers on the crops. What am I doing wrong? OK, so um, okra, I, I've found with okra that okra likes a little bit of abuse, so <laughs> If you are, uh, and, and again, remember when you have your fertilizer, your NPK, the first, I always tell people the first letter, of course, nitrogen that grows the leaves. The second one is for flowering, okay? And you wanna get a, a fertilizer that has that middle number that's probably a little bit more unified for that and put that down if you can give it some water also plant i would stress that plant out a little matter of fact okay okra scratch the water i'd stress the plant out a little bit and make it look for the nutrients within the soil uh, and that may do the trick for you paul brandy do you have any suggestions on okra other than that no i i i think what you were going to say about it's if, if the plant's too happy it's not going it's it's still staying in that vegetative stage so it's not going to the reproductive stage so it's not setting flowers so it's either too much nitrogen or you're you're just like you, like you said um, you got to stress it a little in order to for it to go from vegetative to reproductive so um, yeah maybe run it a little bit drier um, and and see if that will sort of sort of uh, shock it into um, uh, producing flowers. Yeah, I was going to say too. Um, sunlight amount. Um, not sure what the growing conditions or for the okra, but um, a lot of times if it's not getting enough sunlight, um, you know everything couldn't. Uh, uh, that could be affecting uh, flowering as well. Okay. Oh. OK, uh, Kim, we got another one here. Um, powdery mildew. Um, how do you treat for it or do you just rip the plant out? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on how bad your powdery mildew is. I mean, if it's covered the whole plant, uh, yeah, I'd probably just pull that thing out. 
but if it's just in a, a couple spots, you can use like a horticulture oil and just follow the instructions on the, the back of that bottle and use that and maybe that'll, that'll help with the powdery mildew. Also, it's important to remember to try to thin those plants out so they have uh, the air, the moisture that goes through and that helps with some of the problem. Paul, would you suggest anything else besides the horticulture oil for the powdery mildew? I, I, I think that would be uh, the best thing. Uh, and that, like you said, the cultural practice, practices, um, you know, don't water late at night, try to keep the foliage dry, um, you know, have airflow, things like that. You want, you want to break that cycle um, for those uh, spores to germinate and take hold. So, okay. um, do you All prefer right. pellet? Okay, uh, let me see. We got another one here. Do you prefer pelletized seeds for plants like carrots and lettuce? And is there any difference in planting with them? Um, uh, <laughs> I, I don't, uh, if I'm working with kids, I'll use pelletized seeds. They're just a little bit easier to see. Um, I, I see no difference between the pelletized seeds and the seeds that don't have the coating on them. Uh, they, they grow the same for me. So I think it's just a, a personal preference. It's all in what you want to use. All righty. Yeah, I just find pelletized seeds are a little bit easier to handle and work with uh, sometime than the raw seed. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's really just a, just your preference yeah all right kim all right. well th that is it excellent job on handling all these questions uh we want to thank you folks for joining us and uh we will see you next thursday at 10 a.m so you guys have a great day thank you bye everybody